Hello. In this video we're going to take a look at how you can use the UBX binary protocol to get data from a UBlox GPS module onto your Arduino and do it in a much much more efficient way than the typical method of using the NMEA data sentences. So before we start I should point out that this is only going to work on one of these UBlox modules um, but they're pretty common so I think it's it's worth making a video to explain how this is done. Uh, I've tried it specifically I've tried it on this one here which is a 6M Neo 6M and I've also tried it on a Neo 7M and it seems to be exactly the same on both of those and I'm only going to get some pretty basic data here just to that long basically just that's all I'm, I'm interested in um, but I will explain how you can do the same method with other types of um, information like how many satellites you can see and all, all that kind of stuff that the GPS module knows about. Um, so why would you even want to do this um, I guess is a, is a good question. So to take a look at the typical way that this is done first uh, the, at least this is what I started using and I think most people when they start using GPS modules with Arduino will probably come across this tiny GPS++ library pretty early on because it comes up in the um, Google searches quite easily when you're looking for Arduino libraries for GPS and it's a pretty good library I've used it uh, up until well basically up until today I've been using it um, but I think I'll use this UBX method from now on uh, so it's a library that you can include and you do some stuff here but I'm not really going to explain what all this is but I just wanted to show um, how much this increases the size of your sketch because that's kind of the the point that we're getting at here so if I compile the sketch as is uh, notice that this is commented out so the only thing the sketch is doing at the moment is the serial begin and we're getting 1666 bytes there. Now if I uncomment the tiny GPS stuff and run that again, uh, compile that again, now it's up to 4496 bytes. So that's around about 2800 bytes that it's increased the program size. And it's also going to use more memory because it needs to store the stuff that it's reading in from the serial connection and it needs to do more work to process that. It needs to pass uh, strings of text. Um, so it's not too bad um, but this was actually a problem for me and as you can see we only have a 32 kilobyte maximum so to be increasing your program size by about 2800 bytes is close to 10% of all of the program space you have available. And <clears throat> when you're making rather large sketches you will find this to be a problem and it's such a common problem that um, if you do a search for GPS I2C like this you'll see a bunch of solutions and libraries and stuff to um, to offload this GPS parsing and calculations from the main Arduino into another sort of a sub-processor and you can even buy dedicated boards like this and uh, there's this one here which is seems to be a dedicated board to do exactly that um, <clears throat> and actually I, I came across this problem myself when I was making my radio control car with the return to home functionality and I got around it by just making <laughs> offloading the work onto a second Arduino Pro Mini so the one on the right there is connected to the GPS and all it's doing is reading in the GPS passing those NMEA strings and then giving it to the other Arduino so that's that's the kind of <coughs> links that people are going to to um, get around this problem of of having to pass a lot of data so um, we can actually look at what this data is in great detail by installing a program for Windows called UCenter. So I've already installed it here, of course. 
Uh, I'll put a link in the description to a really good page. Um, where is it? This page here is quite good. It's got a lot of um, info about all the stuff that we're doing and somewhere it's got a link to this program. Where is it? You center, yeah. So if you if you look at this section here, you'll find links to this, and um, you can apparently run this on Linux, but uh, it didn't work too well for me, so I'm uh, using my um, Windows laptop here. Anyway, so when you run the program like this, um, you'll see this, and it's not connected yet. And I have here my GPS module, of course, and I'm connecting this with an FTDI adapter. Uh, USB to serial adapter. This is this is just the one that I was using earlier to um, upload things onto my Pro Mini and stuff for the quadcopter project. And that's connected to the laptop there. And you just need four wires there in the usual configuration. So that's ground goes to ground, VCC goes to VCC, and the RX and the TX go to each other. But of course they are swapped over. So that's pretty pretty typical. And when you look at that in here, um, if you go over here, you can see that there will be some COM ports there. And it won't be exactly obvious which one it is. Uh, you can just try them one by one, or you can also go to, uh, where is the device manager thing? In the device manager, you can see ports, COM, and LPT. So we can see here USB serial port. That's the one that's my serial adapter, and that's on COM10. So you can know for sure if you look in a device manager like that. And you can set the port and the board rate. The board rate will be 9600 by default that seems to be the way all of the um, GPS modules are shipped and you can also set the board rate here and there's somewhere you can set it to be automatic where is that oh auto boarding so if you check that it should just figure out what the board rate is anyway anyway so I'm going to connect to COM10 and we won't see much happening except we can see now that the little button has gone green and down here we can see we're on COM10 at 9600 board. Now, <clears throat> still not much to look at. Um, of course this module that I'm using here is supposed to have an antenna on it, but this is the one that I broke when I was driving my car into the wall over and over. Well, my car was driving itself into the wall, it wasn't my fault. So we're not going to see any actual GPS data coming from this in this video, unfortunately, but it doesn't really matter. Um, just pretend that there's valid data coming through. Um, I'm indoors anyway, so it probably wouldn't um, work too well to start with. So anyway, um, we can't see anything happening over here because there's nothing valid. But what we can do is look in the under the view menu. There's a bunch of views and consoles that we can see. And I just want to look at the top three for now. So the first one is Packet Console, and you can see about five lines at a time coming in there. And the Packet Console just gives us a summary of what data is um, coming from the GPS module. And as you can see, it's at a rate of about one update per second. Like that. And there's quite a few... Uh, packets I guess you could call them and like I say there's about five and sorry <laughs> keep closing it um, let me just stop it scrolling okay um, so this is the default settings for a lot of the ubox modules as far as I can tell and only one of these is one that we're really interested in which is um, it's, um, if I forget which one it is, it's either this Global Positioning System Fixed Data or Geographic Position Latitude Longitude. Actually, I think both of those have a lat long in them, so we're kind of getting a little bit of redundant data anyway. 
Um, so that's that's the um, packet console, and the next one I want to look at is text console. And as we can see, this is showing us the NMEA strings that are coming from the GPS module. And once again, this is updating roughly five or six lines once per second. And you can see that there's a whole bunch of commas in a row here. And that's just because there's no valid data coming from this module because there's no antenna attached and I'm inside. But normally these lines would be quite a bit longer. They would be f filled with information about what satellites are visible and the lat long position and everything. So this is the data that the Arduino has to read in and pass as a text string and figure out what it means. So one thing that you can do immediately to give your Arduino less work to do is turn off some of these messages. So like I said, it's only the, only the GPGLL or maybe this one, <laughs> GPGGA I think it was. Well, so one of those two is, is all you really need. Um, so even if you're not interested in doing this U-Blocks UBX binary protocol thing, you might be interested in getting hold of this U-Center app and connecting it to your uh, GPS module and turning off some of these message messages. Okay, um, now let's have a look at the binary console while we're here. And the binary console is basically, if we make this a bit bigger, we can see on the right hand side the text strings that we were just looking at in the text console. And then on the left hand side, or in the middle rather, we can see the each one of those bytes as it is represented. So this is GP, GSV, and the 2C is a comma, I guess. So anyway, that's that's the binary data at the moment, which is actually just it's just text data really. Um, okay, so let's try rearranging these settings a little bit so that instead of giving us all that screeds and screeds of text data, the GPS module will just give us very concise binary data instead. Now to figure out what we need or what data we want it to give us, we kind of have to do some reading of the data sheet. So this is where we get to looking at the binary protocol and what we're doing um, with the binary protocol. Uh, let's just go down. Hold on a second. Okay, here it is. <laughs> so UBX protocol is what we're what we're interested in. Um, and we want to look at the packet structure. And here we can see, um, so rather than sending in a string of text all the time, the binary protocol will give us a sequence of bytes like this. And just to just to quickly look at this, because we we do kind of need to know what's going on here to understand the the source code later. Uh, it starts off with two bytes, which are just they're going to be this micro symbol and then a B. So that's a, some um, branding from U-Blocks, I guess. So there's always going to be those two bytes and they mark the start of each packet. So we can look for those bytes in the incoming stream to know when the packet's going to start. Then there'll be two bytes to say what kind of category of message this is. And then there'll be two bytes to say how long the payload is. And then there'll be the payload itself, which is going to be a fixed length, um, which is very useful for us, so we don't have to pass any varying string lengths of strings in. And then we'll have two bytes to function as a checksum, just to make sure that we've read in everything previous to that correctly. Um, and down here a little bit, we will also see a little bit of information about the number formats and how many bytes is in each one so an unsigned short is two bytes unsigned long is four bytes and so on so this is pretty standard stuff 
but it's just good to have a, a proper data sheet like this to see what's going on. And we also need to know how to calculate the checksum. And we can do that by using this little bit of pseudocode here. And this is telling us that the checksum will be calculated on this range of bytes. So it's starting from the category and goes all the way through to the end of the payload. So this may seem a bit complicated, but it's not really that much coding um, when it comes to it. Um, what should we look at next? All right, let's go back to table contents. And I'll just jump straight to the one binary message that I'm using. There's quite a lot of them, but um, the one that I'm interested in is just the lat long information, which is in the nav category. And it is called POS LLH. I'm not really sure what, POS, uh, what the LLH stands for, but this is a geodetic position solution packet. So if I click on here, it'll take me down to that page, and we can see. Um, so remember the packet structure that we were looking at just before, it has the header, which is always those two bytes. Then there's the category, which is those two bytes, and always two, those two bytes for this packet. And then a length of 28, and then the payload is described here. Uh, so I chose this packet type to use, or this message, message type to use, because it's the smallest one I could find that had the longitude and latitude in it. There are some other messages that have also have latitude and longitude, but they are quite a bit longer, and I wanted to just stick with the short 28 bytes, um, if possible. So I think it should be okay for now. Um, so what we can get from this is GPS millisecond time of week, not really interested in that. Longitude, latitude, that's what we want. Height above the ellipsoid, um, don't really need to go into details about that, but it's basically the height above the Earth um, where you are on the Earth. And then there's some other heights and accuracy estimates that we're not really interested in either. Um, and one thing that we should also take note of here is see important comments concerning validity of position given in section navigate, navigation output filters. Because this packet here is fairly limited, uh, we don't have a lot of information about sp special stuff like um, dilution of precision and how many satellites this information is taken from and um, how accurate it is apart from this this very basic estimate. So if we click on this link, it's quite nice how everything's linked in this PDF file. Uh, we can look at navigation output filters and the important thing to note is to qualify a position as valid, the GPS fix OK flag in the UBX nav status message must be checked. Now I'm not checking that um, because I'm intending to be looking at a readout of the position that this is giving me on a map uh, on my on my tablet screen. So I'll be able to see whether the reading that it's giving me makes sense and when it looks like it's got a fix, I'll just start using it. Uh, but if you don't have that kind of a facility to see what it's doing, you might want to also use this UBX nav status message, which is down here. Um, and this is not too long either, so I might might actually just use this one as well. It's only 16 bytes. And this has a field called flags here. And this flags, one of these bits in this flags is down here somewhere bit field flags there, flags. Uh, so that's this bit here, GPS fix, okay. So if this bit is set, then you'll know that you have a proper GPS fix. Uh, so like I say, I'm not, I'm not checking that, but um, hopefully it won't matter. Anyway, so that's, that's probably quite a lot to take in, but if we go back to the U-Blocks, uh, the U-Center setting program, now we'll be able to make a bit more sense of some of these other views. And let's look at these two. Uh, let's look at this one here, Messages view. Now this is where we can see 
all of the individual messages. For example, we saw some before that were GPGGA and GP. What was it? GPRMC, maybe? I forget already. But anyway, this is all the GG stuff here. And you can click on these to see what kind of information each one of those messages will give you. And it may be a little bit hard to notice, but some of them are gray and some of them are black. And I really wish they had made this like blue and red or something instead so that it would be easier to see. Because gray and black is just really annoying. Um, but the ones that are in black are enabled. So we should be able to look through here and see the ones in black. There should be about five or six of them. And those are the ones that if we looked in our um, text console or our packet console, we'll see those messages as those five and six that are showing up. Now, I don't want to use any of those NMEA sentences. So what I'm going to do is right click on here and say disable child messages. So that will go through the, all the children of this NMEA tree and turn them all off. So now if I go to my packet console, we don't have anything showing up. And likewise in the text console, nothing. So the GPS module is sending absolutely nothing to to this program or to your Arduino if you were connected to the Arduino. So absolutely nothing is not very useful. But there's another category here, UBX. This is the binary protocol protocol messages that we were just looking at. And the one that we were interested in, in was in the NAV category. So we can look in here. And it was POS LLH, which is there. Um, so I can right click on here and I can enable message. And that, like I say, it's hard to tell, but it, that made this text turn black, not gray anymore. Um, so now if we look at our packet console, we'll see UBX nav pos LLH 36 bytes geodetic position. And it's coming in once per second. And if we look at the text console, we'll see, as before, nothing, which is fine. But if we look at our binary console, we can see each packet coming in there. And of course, we can't make, <coughs> can't make much sense of this area on the right except for the first two which is the UB or micro UB and as we saw in the uh, data sheet the first two bytes of this each packet is going to be B562 so as we can see there B562 is matching up with that uh, 1, 2 was our POS, POS LLH category where is that? Here we go. So we've got B5, 6, 2, 1, 2, <laughs> B5, 6, 2, 1, 2. So the first four bytes there you can see are the header section. And then after that we have the 28 bytes of, uh, oh, I'm sorry, no, we have 1C, which is 28, I think. And then the rest of it is the payload and the, and the um, checksum. So hopefully you can make a, a match up between the binary data that you see streaming in here and what you see in the... Uh, data sheet over here. It's all a bit um, a bit much to put into a video perhaps but uh, if somebody had told me this six months ago I would have been grateful so this is kind of why I'm doing the video. So anyway this is coming in at one one packet per second which is a little bit slow really isn't it? So we can also go into the config category of our UBX. I'll just close that. And in the config category, there should be one called rate. And in here, you can change the measurement period to be 100 milliseconds 
instead of the default of 1000. So that will take the navigation frequency up to 10 Hertz. Now I found with my other module that it would not accept this. It would only accept 200 milliseconds, which would put the rate at 5 Hertz. And I think the reason for that is, as I'll show you in a minute, uh, I remember reading somewhere in one of the data sheets that the 10 Hertz rate is only available when you're only using GPS, so you're not using the GLONASS or any of those other um, systems. So anyway, I'll just I'll put this to 100 milliseconds for 10 Hertz, and as soon as I click away to somewhere else, it'll say, "Don't you want to uh, save that?" So I'm like, "Yes, I do want to." Um, <clears throat> so I think you can click send down here to to send things to the GPS module um, as you're setting them up. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, oh, okay, so like I say, I'm using the Neo 6 module here and when I used my Neo 7 I noticed in this GNSS config tab right now I'm using the the 6 so none of these are enabled but when I was using the 7 these checkboxes here, here were um, some of them had checks in and some of them had no checks and I found that I needed to uncheck <coughs> excuse me uncheck everything except for GPS and that's the configuration that will let you use 10 Hertz update rate uh, at least if I remember correctly that's that's what I was doing um, but like I say I'm using the Neo 6 at the moment so none of these checkboxes are available it looks like I'm stuck with just GPS only and that's why I was able to use 10 Hertz anyway so I don't need to do anything here but if you're using the Neo 7 you should uncheck everything except for GPS here under the enable column. All right, so we can send that to the um, GPS module there. And then to save this, um, where is that configuration? If you click on the configuration, so it's config, config, uh, then there'll be something here called save current configuration. Leave that radio button selected and click send and as far as I know that should save everything onto the onto the GPS module it's a I'm a bit confused about this still because sometimes it seems not to save it and there's also under the receiver menu there's also this thing called action where you can save config uh, so I'm not entirely sure what these are all about because if I click save config doesn't really seem to do anything but if I I find if I do both of those um, and send it, it it seems to get saved at some point but I'm still not totally sure what what the deal is with that so anyway um, let me just close that and just double check that my binary console is giving me 10 Hertz so now you can see these messages coming in a lot quicker Oops. Oh, I seem to have lost the scrolling. Hold on. Let's look at the packet console. Okay, so now it's it's running at 10 hertz, which is what we wanted. Uh, I like to double check by disconnecting and then also disconnecting the power to the module so it's completely off. And then reconnecting that and sometimes this reconnects automatically but I guess I've turned that off okay com 10 so now we've reconnected and let's look at that packet console again okay so it looks like the settings were saved and we should have a, a 10 Hertz update rate so that's it for the setup um, and there's not really too much more to show because the rest of it's basically just just you copy and paste <laughs> this source code that I've got. Um, so I've, I was going to show this at the beginning, but um, here's uh, the source code that I'm using to read this data in on the Arduino. It's not really much. If I put my mouse cursor here, 
we should see I'm not sure if this is going to be on your screen but it says 66 which means there's only 66 lines to do all of this and once again it's commented out and if I compile this sketch we'll see that again it's 1666 bytes and that's because it's only doing serial begin now if I uncomment my code to do this and then compile again it goes from 1666 to 1870 so it's only going up by just over 200 bytes versus the 2800 bytes that the tiny GPS was um, adding to the sketch size and it's also using much less memory because if we go over this just briefly um, it's uh, another long video already isn't it is anyone still watching? <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, just just let's look at this quickly. Uh, so we have a uh, two bytes that we're expecting to see as the beginning of each packet. So that's the the micro B thing and the B. So this is uh, the U blocks header, and then we have a structure, which is the POS LLH structure. So again, this is coming from the data sheet and you can see in here what I've put so the class and the ID are these two bytes then we have a short unsigned short which should store the length of the rest of the payload and then the actual payload itself will be what comes after the length so that's the time of week and such so hopefully you should be able to match up this set of variables with the set of stuff that's in the data sheet so this is what I was saying about if you want to change this to bring in some of those other messages that have more information like the nav sol this one here is 52 bytes long which is why I didn't really want to use it but still not that big but this gives you a whole lot of other information um, and then there was another one that was even more descriptive than that that was 80 something bytes which I also didn't want to use of course but anyway all you need to do if you want to use a different type of um, message is modify uh, look at the data sheet and figure out which one you want to use and then modify this section here to be matching with that and then set up the um, set up the messages correctly in this um, messages setup to get the message that you want Anyway, so that's that's the what's inside each um, packet is coming in there, and so we just have an instance of that, and then we have a function that calculates the checksum as we were told to do in the data sheet again. So all of this is coming straight from the data sheet, really, uh, and then we have a function which is um, this does the actual reading of the GPS coming in from the serial connection. So I'm using the standard serial here. If you wanted to use software serial, you would have to replace this with your software serial variable. So just those two spots there would need to change. Uh, so all this does really is it keeps track of what position it thinks it is inside that um, binary data frame. So it starts off at zero and then it tries to find the two bytes that are in the UBX header, which is the B5 and the 6.2. And once it's found those, then it just reads in each successive byte as it gets to it. And it just puts it straight into the structure. And then when it's read enough bytes in to, to think that it should be at the end of the structure, then it does uh, it calculates the checksum. So that lets it know what the next two bytes should be if everything's going okay. And then it reads in those next two bytes and compares them with the uh, with the checksum that it's expecting and if it if everything works out it will set got new data to true and then when we return from the function if this function returns true we'll know that we got some new data to use so that's what's going on here in the loop uh, all we need to do is call process GPS if that returns true then we've just got a, a new GPS data update that we can do something with 
So yeah, that's only 66 lines of code. It only adds 200, 200 odd bytes to the program size. And memory wise, well, you can work out from the size of the structure. It's, it's, uh, this is structures, I think 30, 30, uh, 32 bytes or something. And then there'll be a few variables here that we're using, but I think it's, it's probably adding less than 40 bytes to the, um, memory, the RAM that the program is using, using. So all in all, I think it's pretty, pretty small and efficient and a much better way to do things. Um, of course, the reason for using the NMEA system is that it's much more flexible and it's a standard that a lot of um, different GPS modules are using. Um, but like I say, I'm only going to be using these U-Blox ones from now on. They're pretty cheap, they're all over the place, um, easy to get hold of, easy to use. I really like I really like that um, U-Center utility as well. So let's just... Uh, By the way, you can see the 10 hertz update right there. When that light, it's a bit hard to see, but there we go. You can double check that your 10 hertz is working properly by how fast this light is flashing. Anyway, let's just, uh, to finish the video off, let's see if we can actually get this to work. So in the um, in the link in the description, I'll put in a link to a zip file which has this sketch that I just looked at, UBX GPS. But as you can see, this doesn't actually do anything. Um, I've just left that blank. So to let you test things out quickly, I'll also put in this other sketch, which is called UBX GPS. SS and the SS is for software serial so what I'm doing here is I just include software serial and I have a, a lowercase s version of serial running on pins 3 and 5. Uh, everything after that point is all exactly the same except for the part that's reading in the GPS data so you would pl plug your RX and TX of your GPS onto pins 3 and 5 and then the only other thing that's different is that in the loop we are printing out the information that we are getting in that POS LLH structure. So uh, I think I might have already have this set up to run. Oh, okay, <laughs> there it is. So that's that's what you should expect to see when you run this. Although of course I'm only seeing zeros there because. Like I say, there's no antenna attached and I'm inside. Um, but you should at least be able to see the the time of week counter counting up. And you should be able to see that it's running at 10 hertz update rate. Um, so a bit of an anticlimax really to look at this data with all zeros. But um, yeah, that's <laughs> just just trust me. I mean, if you if you plug it. GPS in that's um, if you're outdoors and it has an antenna and everything you'll you'll see this working properly I just don't really want to broadcast my location to the internet that's all um, so yeah that's it I'll leave this link in the description and um, ask me questions in the comments if uh, things don't work out thanks for watching <laughs> another long video they always get so long don't they um, and that's about it, I think. I'm just trying to think if I've forgotten anything. Don't think so. All right, thanks for watching, and I'll see you later. Oh, oops, wrong button. <laughs>